So welcome everybody. It's really good to see you all back together again as a panel. Um, and thank you for taking the time to come back and contribute and reflect uh, two years on from the work that we did together on the Topol Review. So it, was, it is two years ago, February 2019, that we published the Topol Review, chaired by Dr. Eric Topol, who brought together a remarkable team of people, educators, ethicists, fellows, uh, engineers, economists, leaders in digital technologies, and not least yourselves as clinical fellows and clinical entrepreneurs who really delivered that work and supported the expert advisory panels. So uh, the report went through to the Secretary of State for Health. It's, it, it's been very well publicised and received since then. But here we are two years later. Um, and how does it all look now? How, how has your experience played it out? Evidently, when we published this in 2019 from Health Education England, no one could have predicted the pandemic that's here. Possibly a pandemic, yes, but the, the pandemic that we've now experienced. Um, uh, and the impact on that, and what does that mean for digital technologies and how the recommendations from the report played out I think are of genuine interest at this point two years on. So we gathered you together to think about it. I'm going to ask each of you first of all to introduce yourselves by name and we'll go around around the group. Tell us what role you played in the review um, and just a tiny bit about the role that you're playing now and then we'll come back and take forward a, a conversation through and look for your reflections but some introductions first please. Um, could I go to Matt please? Sure so um, I'm a GP partner at St Clement's Practice in Winchester now and I'm digital primary care clinical lead for the Wessex AHSN um, and in the review I was concentrating on the digital medicine and the education side. Thank you David. Hello everybody so my name is David Cox I'm a consultant neonatologist at Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust and have just finished a topple fellowship in digital healthcare which is a fellowship which sprung out out of the topple review and that was really exciting to complete. Thank you David. Jess. Hi I'm Jess Maris. I'm a clinical immunology registrar working at the Royal Free Hospital in London and I was the Topol Clinical Fellow for Genomics. Thank you. Sangeetha. Hi, I'm Sangeetha Sornalingam. I'm a GP in Brighton and I'm a GP educator. Um, I was involved in the Topol Review, predominantly looking at organisational development. Henrietta. Hi, I'm Henrietta Mbjörbankas and I'm the Head of Blended Learning and the Workstream Lead for Digital Literacy at Health Education England. And in terms of the review, I was the project lead, but also focused on health, the health inequality section with um, Elizabeth Manero. Thank you. And I'm Sue Lacey Bryant. Um, I'm the National Lead for NHS Library and Knowledge Services across England. And my role in the Total Review is as Review Programme Manager. So a delight to see you all again. I must say it's an absolute pleasure this afternoon. So I'm going to ask each of you in turn to reflect uh, two years on on the piece of work that you were doing uh, and the recommendations of that panel as they've played out and as you're observing them now from your experience over the last two years. So uh, a chance for each of you to, to, to tell us where, where this now sits as you look at, it, at, at this work looking back. So David, can I start with you from yeah. the AI and robotics panel? Yeah, so it was, I have to say, I read, had the chance to reread the review recently. Um, and being the clinical fellow for the AI and robotics panel, I was really pleased. The recommendations are, I think we came up with, I think were very good. Um, there were four key recommendations. The first one was about ensuring that there was patient involvement in all the technology kind of design and delivery going forward. And I think from the role of a practicing clinician, as well as a patient, as we all are in these COVID days, um, there's been variable success with this. I think it's part of the strategy. And I think NHSX and the AI lab, which has sprung up, has that as a core component. Um, but it still feels like it's not a complete offering because obviously AI technologies are coming from different areas for the NHS. Some are centralised, commissioned, coming through the kind of AI lab and the new skunk work scheme that they've got. 
and they've got really good patient involvement. But we're also seeing AI technologies developed by the commercial sector and their patient involvement is pretty variable. It's nice that in NHSX's code of conduct that was published, they highlight that and they're trying to hold kind of companies deploying AI to account with that. But that's quite variable. One of the second recommendations was about education um, uh, and education and professional resources for clinicians, healthcare professionals around the key facets of AI and, autom and autonomous systems. And again, it's it's good. So the resources are being developed. Um, if you look at a number of different sites, so academic sites from different universities, HEE site, NHSX's site, there's some lovely content there. Uh, one of my favourites actually on the NHSX site, they actually point to a resource by the DSTL. So this is kind of Defence Science Technology Lab who've got a, a what they call a biscuit booklet, biscuit guide on AI, which is actually really lovely for clinicians to pick up and it walks them through many of the kind of key facets. But I'm still not sure that these are advertised and that people are fully engaging with this stuff. So it feels like the resources are being curated, but whether they're getting disseminated and picked up, I still think there's a lot of difference in the system. I think enthusiasts are, but it's not hit the totality of the workforce. And this is something I'm particularly interested in with the top of fellowship. One of the things that I was looking at was actually educational strategy for stuff like electronic health records, because educational strategy is far more than just producing a resource. It's how that gets taken up by an individual, how it leverages into the training they get to do their everyday tasks, what that means for real world practice and actually what else you need as a clinician to develop in order to use those skills. So that's something I'm really interested in. The last two were, I think, about the last two recommendations from the AI and robotics panel were about the NHS trying to leverage how it could bring in expert clinical resource or expert technical resource. Um, so one of the recommendations was about leveraging its global, uh, global reputation and integrated data sets. And I think it's done fairly well with that in terms of it's put out a series of grand challenges, which have been adopted quite well by the system. And obviously COVID being pretty much the greatest grand challenge we will ever see in our lifetime. There's been a lot of work in terms of the data science and AI that's gone around that with varying degrees of success. And the other thing that was recommended was the national strategy for an IXN for the NHS, which I'm absolutely delighted to say has come to fruition. So recently, well, just after the topical review, they launched the IXN for the NHS. And recently, as January, there was a project called the 20,000 Masters uh, students projects for NOL across lots of different universities across the NHS working with the NHS on clinical projects and I think this is brilliant I think that's a game changer because it's how we get computer scientists as well as many many other technical disciplines to get and take part in creating proof of concept work for the NHS get taken forward and it's um it's been one of my privileges to be the kind of project lead or the client lead on a couple of those projects and it's really interesting work so that's kind of where I am in a nutshell, where I think it's gone. That's fantastic overview. Thank you very much, James. It's a great practical e examples there. Um, not least a biscuit guide, uh, but uh, you know, really, really good to see the progress there uh, and hear about the IXM work. I, I know you were really passionate about that. Yeah. That's really good. If I could go on to Jess, following on from that. I think she may have some technical difficulties. Technical there. difficulties there. OK, I did wonder. OK, we'll go. Um, we'll go to you, Matt, if we may. Sure. Um, so uh, after the top of review, I moved back into general practice and that, that, that was quite insightful, moving from a, an aspirational what's going to happen over the next 20 years to a, what's happening now. Why is my um, why can't I plug in my cables because the cables are too short so the screens aren't working to, to things like that. But I wanted to take forward the aspirations of the top of review and see how they could make our lives different and how they can make our patients lives different. Uh, so I kind of I didn't look at the individual um, recommendations, but I tried to distill them down into a, a couple of things. So one was on mutually beneficial relationships with industry. So. I started working with the OHSN and that's been 
I mean, they're like the NHS's best kept secret, I think, glue between the innovators, the tech companies and the frontline workers. So that's been great. Um, and then the other thing was about digital literacy and, and sort of confidence, motivation and experience. Um, and that, that was across all of the, um, uh, the groups, but particularly we talked about it in the education section. Um, and so on that front, uh, I started working with digital experience, uh, sorry, GP uh, experience trainers, trainees, uh, retainees, and did uh, workshops over the last year and a half. And then I started a, a local fellowship for looking at digital literacy or digital readiness within general practice. And that's actually just been published yesterday. So uh, you're very welcome to have a look at it if you want. <laughs> Um, but I, I suppose uh, very briefly about that. So it was a, it was a sequential mixed method study. It was involving uh, 33 practices in, in North and Mid Hampshire. And we just looked at the factors and aspects that impacted on digital readiness. And it's quite significant in from, from the different technology groups to the individual factors who we found self-efficacy, uh, so sort of that perceived um, uh, sort of perceived capability was really significant. So it wasn't motivation that um, previous research was suggesting, but more when you get stuck, what do you do about it? Um, found that younger staff, uh, those in post for less than five years, and interestingly, non-clinical staff are more digitally competent. And we need to combine our forces rather than suggesting it's all from a, a clinical lead. Um, and then uh, we, we found that there's significant practices there's significant differences between practices, but particularly between practices outside of PCNs and different regions. So there's this complacency at looking at your neighbour and we actually need to have demonstrator sites and understand where everyone else is going and, and take insight from that. Um, but the biggest thing I think we found um, was, was the impact of uh, patients over 65 on staff digital readiness. And I think that just speaks volume for what we were saying in the report, which was about digital exclusion and and making sure that we're not leaving people behind uh, with with inequalities. And and so I think there's a real role to play with uh, patient participation groups and and uh, digital nurse champions. And then the obvious obvious impact of COVID, which we, I'm sure we can talk about um, till the cows come home, but I'll leave it there. That's really helpful. And I think that naturally leads on to, to speaking to you, Henrietta, and asking for your for your comments. And you were really closely involved in uh, in looking at the impact around equalities and health inequalities. Would you like to go on to that point next? And then I'll come to colleagues. Yeah, no, that, that's a really interesting point. And I think for me, what's what's key, and certainly from the mental health um, topo review, is the fact that within, well, following the publication in 2019, that between one and five, uh, uh, the year one to five, telemedicine mm -hmm. was an area that was already in existence, but looking at how acceptable it would be for the provision of mental health care, obviously with, with COVID, everything has been accelerated and tele telehealth has actually gone up. But there is something about generalizing and the fact that, you know, people or assumptions around who is this acceptable for, which is where the workforce comes in. So being able to use your knowledge of, you know, the, your, the patients or service users you're caring for to understand what works for who, I think it's key rather than generally assuming that this will not be acceptable for this person or that person. Because in a recent review by the Policy Research Unit at UCL, what was identified was the fact that for some patients, actually they embraced telehealth and were very welcoming of it. Whereas others actually said, I want to be able to separate, you know, my health issues with my home life and as a result actually want to go in and see somebody. There was also an issue around the fact that 
generally people who access mental health services or a number of people who access mental health services may have other disadvantages and hence issues around um, um, privacy, issues around access to the tech itself, which is where the exclusion comes in, needs to, needs to be to be explored. So I think there isn't a, a simple, straightforward answer. There are lots of considerations from patient perspective, but also from staff perspective, because we talk about the digital exclusion usually it, almost as an issue for citizens or patients or service users, but more and more it, it is clear that it, it is an issue for staff as well. Thank you very much, Henrietta. And it's really interesting how you taking get, going further and further into the depth of this and then we can come back round perhaps in a in a moment or two to what that means for the educational strategy coming out so I know where David's been really focusing attention on this too. Jess welcome would you like to um, share some of your reflections and observations on where we're at now with the recommendations that came from the work you were doing with the genomics panel? Well, um, I think, first of all, I can't believe it's been two years. Um, I'm now a clinical immunology registrar working at Royal Free Hospital in London. Um, and at the time the Topol review was published, I was finishing my training in genomic medicine and bioinformatics. And I was at a crossroads, really. I was sort of looking for this fresh start. Um, I'd spent nearly five years out of regular patient contact while pursuing research. So going back to clinical medicine was daunting. But on the other hand, I was full of enthusiasm and brimming with ideas on how we were going to revolutionize genomic medicine. And I think that's been, it's, it's overall, I think it's been really positive. I think there has been in that time away, I've seen that actually there's been a huge expansion in the genomics education program, which has been delivered by HEE. Um, more and more young trainees, particularly medical students, are accessing it. And this is happening not only for clinicians, but also um, people in nursing roles, other allied health professionals as well, including clinical laboratory staff who I have um, more day to day contact with now. Um, in terms of. In terms of that patient contact, of course, at first, I think I, I tried to revolutionize the way I, I practice medicine and of course you know I, I tried to put the keyboard away when I was talking to my patients and spent my consultations with patients with patients actually talking and listening instead of typing and 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 all the things that we'd learned about um but of course this is this is really difficult to maintain and I think overall there are lots of um particular uh, organisational cultural barriers that can get in the way and although as I've said I overall I have managed to achieve this in trying to sort of emphasise or put the emphasis on care in healthcare and try to think about what 21st century medicine really looks like for patients and how we can meet patient needs particularly in the in the arena of genomic medicine. Uh, a key outcome from the Topol review was the idea of genomic mainstreaming and this is essentially how we can deliver the benefits, the huge benefits of genomic medicine to clinical specialties and primary care and this may be by offering genomic training for all our healthcare professionals and to identify those who have a rare disease so really empowering them, giving them that knowledge, distributing that knowledge um, and in initiating genetic discussions by integrating genetics into everyday clinical practice. Um, my, my small contribution is probably in, in various parts of my job. So I teach a cohort of medical students as part of my role as an undergraduate teaching and training lead. And we discuss skills of how to take a family history or organising genetic testing or going that step further and delivering a genetic test result to a patient and thinking about the impact that may have on not only the patient, not only the clinical outcome, but also on the wider family and what that means for that patient going forward in addressing their 
um, psychological needs for them and, and their family. My specialty focuses primarily on people with rare disease. So identi early identification for those who may have a genetic component to their immunodeficiency benefits us greatly. We're allowed, we allow to try and uh, find precision therapies and it allows us to make early decisions, particularly um, in treatments such as bone marrow transplantation. And in, I'm incredibly fortunate in being able to uh, have carved out a, 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 a small niche, I guess I'd say, in being able to focus on patients who have an undefined genetic immunodeficiency. So my job is essentially to do some genetic detective work um, and I'm able to take that genetic sequence from literally dots and, and, and letters um, to being able to find a genetic variant and then taking that genetic variant into a lab by taking patient cells, uh, looking for a functional outcome that will show to us that this genetic variant is indeed causing or contributing to that patient's condition. And then being able to go back and feed that back to the families and to, to say, this is the reason why you have this. And I think the next step, which is in trying to tailor treatments and provide treatments is really the, the, the thing that has, hasn't really been there when we were discussing this two years ago. And now we have a huge wealth of opportunities where, whether that's targeted immunotherapies that we are now um, trialing on a lot of patients with genetic immunodeficiency. Um, we have uh, procedures which are and uh, fairly significant features now in, in terms of bone marrow transplantation, which was previously only offered to children, but is now being offered to, to adults as well who are presenting late with primary immunodeficiency. And I think I've, I, I'm incredibly fortunate, fortunate. I love my job and I love being able to, to be able to take all of those steps and, and really being able to then go back and, and and see those patients being involved in transplantation and then following them up and and yes thank it's, you it's 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 been very very useful and and you're describing that there's there's been a significant difference now in, in what can be done and you also talked about a medical education role there so i'm going to move across to sangeetha if i may and i'm going to talk to you a bit later sangeetha I'll ask you to reflect everyone to reflect on on some of the organizational culture issues but could you look back um, on the work that you were doing perhaps with that medical education perspective uh, and your current role first of all would that be all right yeah that's that's fine so I guess um, both in terms of the organizational development and the educational um, recommendations I've kind of tried to take forward in all my educator roles so when I was uh, doing the topple I was still teaching on a leadership program called the Darcy Fellowship and um, at that point I just kind of recognised making that link to people that actually leadership's all types of leadership and there isn't a separate te technology program that you lead actually the fundamental principles are the same um, so making that connection and making sure that technology was brought into the program um, as a discussion point as well um, I guess more so moving into my role as I teach both undergraduates and postgraduate general practice now. Um, I'm a training director, a program director, as well as um, a clinical teaching fellow at university. So it's been really good kind of bringing in the principles um, of using online learning. We were doing that anyway, but COVID has been a massive disruptor um, in a lot of ways for organisational development, but also education as well. And as Matt had said previously, um, it's a real leveller in terms of people's capability. So actually being the tutor or the teacher now, you might not have the knowledge um, of using uh, technology as your students might. So actually it's more of a balanced discussion or facilitated groups in, in some cases. Um, 
Having said that, there is the, you know, doing everything online. I have found it quite challenging because, you know, we're human beings. We love having connection and being together and we do miss that um, component of which I think is important for learning as well to develop peer relationships um, in particular, but also relationships with teachers and students. So I do feel for my current GP registrars when we have half day release, uh, it's all done online, but actually it's those conversations over coffee <laughs> that help bring people and ideas together. So I, yeah, that's that's the, the caveat, I guess. But looking forward to the future, I think there are some really good uh, components of um, using methods like Teams to connect people when they're all in different places and a combination approach um, to educational needs uh, is probably uh, the future for us. Certainly working in uh, education, I've seen that there have been schemes developing to um, bring education together for new practice GPs and nurses. So I've kind of been teaching on that programme as well, I think doing things that are perhaps not clinically based, but things that are important to everyone. So I, I've given a talk on politics and what that means and how that influences our clinical decision making, even though we might hate the term politics. Um, I've also, uh, uh, sorry, I've also been thinking about uh, my role as a GP. And again, thinking about COVID, as someone said before, it's really um, changed the way that we practice clinically, a lot of uh, technology involved, telephone consultations, video consultations, and certainly that's had an impact on our student learners as well. So when they go into general practice, not seeing as many patients and they're having to develop skills to use these new technologies. So um, as part of my role in the university, um, we host simulated surgeries for students to learn with actor patients. And we've, I've, I was leading the transformation of that online. So we've been doing video sims and simple things which I always forget to do, like look into the camera. You kind of have to look up here rather than look at your audience to build rapport. And little, little tips like that um, are what we're kind of developing and also uh, thinking about, um, you know, hearing in telephone consultations if you've got a bit of background noise actually asking the patient what that is is it some building work or is it them clinking a bottle because they're drinking whilst they're on the phone to you so little things like that which perhaps we wouldn't have even thought of um, until we kind of changed the whole way that we were consulting interesting thank you and be before we come back to some of the other sections from topol on the organizational cultural development issues. Um, Henrietta, I wonder if you can um, pick up on anything post Topol in the light of, um, uh, I wonder if you could pick up on anything in the light of the work you've been doing on blended learning since and how far that follows on from the Topol recommendations. Yes, so when Sangeeta was talking about, you know, online and having that um, human connections, that was the first thought I had in terms of um, looking at approaches to education and training our workforce. And certainly, as we know from the evidence that a, a fully online course or a fully classroom based course doesn't really give you an overall um, value and actually a blend of the two. So being able to use the technologies, but also having those face to face elements and, you know, communities of practice and all of that is what gives you some real learning or real value. And as I keep saying, you know, we are socializing to our professions and being able to learn with the technologies just means that people are finishing programs or will finish programs with without fear of using or embracing the use of technologies. So for us, certainly I have been quite excited about the whole blended learning program. It, it really has been challenging because prior to COVID, it was almost um, a question of should we actually be doing this? Whereas now, I think that the, the notion is we need to do this, but thinking about how we do it effectively. So thinking with our regulators, thinking with our higher education institutes and everybody else as to how we can do this best. Again, something that um, um, Sangeetha has already highlighted, because we, there is an assumption that, OK, you can just get the courses online and off you go. But what she's clearly highlighted is faculty 
developing the faculty themselves to really understand the different skills that is required to provide online teaching, you know, being able to develop programs for synchronous and asynchronous learning. So there is a lot that goes into not just, you know, getting the courses online, but actually preparing not just faculty, but students as well to think differently about how they consume the learning that's available to them. But there's finally just to finish, there's something as well about the technologies that are being used to deliver the learning and where you know technologies have the analytics to be able to understand which students are engaging with the learning or not. So there is a lot that goes into effectively delivering a blended learning program. Thank you.